<laughs> Very good to see you. Good to see you this morning. Go ahead and get a Bible out. Open up to 1 Samuel. We're in this study about King David, and we're talking about how King David is atypical, meaning he's not a typical person. He's not, he doesn't behave like other people behave. And so far, what we've seen in the series is we've saw, we saw that King David um, wasn't the choice for king that everybody else would have made. He was an atypical choice for king, but God chose him as the king of Israel because he had a heart for God. Along with his heart for God also came this conviction. David had the conviction that if he stood up for God, that God would stand with him. And that's what led David out that day into that valley to face that nine foot tall giant because he knew that God was going to give him victory. Well, today what we're going to do is we're going to look at a couple different meetings that, that David has with King Saul. And both of the meetings are atypical. Both of these meetings are not normal. And we're going to see the difference today between Saul and King David. And that difference is pride versus faith. Everybody say pride versus faith. You ready? Pride versus faith. That is the difference between these two men. Pride versus faith. The downfall of Saul. What was the downfall of Saul? It was his pride, right? What contributed to the rise of David to being king? It was the fact that David believed God, he trusted God, he decided to be obedient to God. So David was a man of what? David was a man of faith in God. So today we're going to pick up after after David kills the giant, right? After David kills the giant Goliath and Israel pursues the Philistine army, man, you would think that would be such an amazing victory that King Saul would be happy, right? You think that was such an amazing victory that King Saul would finally be happy to be rid of that giant Goliath. You'd think that the victory of his army over the Philistine army would be just this amazingly joyous occasion. And it was. But what we find as we read, we find this little chant. As you're looking at the text, you know what I'm talking about? Okay, so we find this little chant, this little, this little victory chant. And it's kind of like today when you go to sporting events, right? They play certain songs to celebrate. They play certain songs to get the, get the crowd hyped up. Those songs are declarations that our team is going to clobber your team, right? You know what I'm talking about? It's like, uh, we will rock you, right? Everybody, right? I was watching this thing the other day, and they were talking about worldwide soccer, about how they've adopted, it's a, it's a, a newer, song, newer song than that, but they've adopted this song called Seven Nation Army by the White Stripes. So you go to soccer games, and you hear, boom, 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 right? That's kind of their song that gets everybody kind of into it and hyped up. Well, you read in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 7, and there is a little victory chant there, like those songs, a little victory chant. And it's not only here, but you you see it several other places. So apparently, it became a hit song of the day, right? (laughs) Even the Philistines know about the song. So it's a pretty popular song. Even foreign nations know about the song. It's a popular song. Here's how it goes. Saul has slain his thousands, David his tens of thousands. Now that doesn't sound as catchy as We Will Rock You or <laughs> Seven Nation Army, but apparently in Hebrew, it's a, catchy little, it's a catchy little chant, right? Now what's the problem with that chant? Now I expect it's true. Anyone want to guess what the problem there is? Yeah. 
So you turn your Bibles to 18, chapter 18. Look at, look at uh, verses 6 through 15. <clears throat> when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with trembles, trembles and lyres. <clears throat> As they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They've credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands? What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul, and he was prophesying in his house while David was playing the lyre, as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I will pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David, but had departed from Saul. So he sent David away from him and gave him command over a thousand men. And David led the troops in their campaigns. In everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. When Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. So... Saul, I guess, in an attempt to kind of get rid of him for a while, gives him a thousand troops, right? Gives him a thousand troops to to go out and he fights against the Philistines. And how would you describe uh, David's war against the Philistines, his fighting against the Philistines? It's successful, right? I mean, he can't, he can't fail in what, he, what he's doing. He, he gets, we get to the beginning of chapter 19 and in chapter 19, we find out he's got this amazing friendship with Saul's son named Jonathan. The two of them have become uh, close friends. David's success in battles made him even more popular and liked by the people. Maybe Saul did this hoping that David would get killed somewhere along the line, right? But he didn't. David just couldn't lose because God was fighting with him. So we keep reading and Saul comes up with the solution. What's Saul's solution? Got to kill him. Got to kill David. Saul knows that God is with David. When, as you're reading through the text, there's a couple different times Saul's confronted with these facts and and, uh, he knows what the right thing is, yet when given enough time, what starts to well up in him again? His pride starts to well up in him again. You get to chapter 19. We see this little stint where Saul takes David back for a while, but then before you know it, what is he doing? Right? Before you know it, what is he doing? He's throwing spears at the boy again, right? At the guy again. So David runs for his life, and over the next several chapters, we see uh, some people that actually help David. And, And one of the people that helps David is this priest named Ahimelech. He is the priest at Nob, okay? He gives David provisions. He gives David the sword of Goliath. Apparently that was kept there in the tabernacle. He gives that to David. He actually inquires and asks God things for David. Does anybody want to guess what happens when Saul hears about this? The priests helping David. The priests giving provisions to David. Helping to equip David. Inquiring to the Lord for David. Anybody want to guess what happens to Saul? Now, Nob is where the tabernacle apparently is. It's located there at that time. The tabernacle is this tent that keeps the Ark of the Covenant. That They use that tabernacle from the time of Moses until they they finally get around in Solomon's time to building the temple later on. And so Nob was this town, and it was populated with Levites. Okay, the town was populated with Levites. They were the priests. They were the people who served at the tabernacle. And because they were priests to the Lord, a faithful person, how would they view those priests? 
A faithful person would view the priests as being what? Hands off, right? Why? Because they're consecrated to the Lord, right? They are the Lord's priests. Yet Saul, because of his pride, when he learns they help David, you know what he does? He gives orders to one of his, one of his soldiers named Doeg to kill the priests. Saul gives orders to kill the priests. And we read 85 priests at the tabernacle are killed. And then he goes into the rest of the town and listen to this. He kills all of the men, the women, the children, the babies, the cattle, the donkeys, and the sheep. Here is a group of people consecrated to the Lord. Here is a town consecrated to the Lord. That which is consecrated to the Lord belongs to the Lord. Amen? Amen. That which is consecrated to the Lord belongs to the Lord. And Saul, because of his injured pride, decides to wipe out an entire town. Listen to this. They were not Saul's to kill. Do you hear that? They were not Saul's to kill. And here's what I mean by that. I mean, there have been priests when you read in the Old Testament, correct? There have been priests that were killed in the Old Testament, like Nadab and Abihu. Anybody remember hearing those names ever? Nadab and Abihu, they were killed by God. Like fire came out of the presence of God and killed them because they changed the recipe for the incense offering, right? So that God told them how to do it. And they're like, ah, we really kind of think this is better. <sighs> fire comes out and kills them. <laughs> Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, it was declared by God, it was prophesied by God that they were going to be killed. And then later they were killed by the Philistines. Why? Because they were corrupt they slept with girls at the tabernacle, right? Later on, we're going to see this Levite named Uzzah. He's killed. Anybody remember why he's killed? He's killed because he touches the Ark of the Covenant, right? God kills that priest. So the priests and the Levites at Nob, first of all, they didn't do anything to deserve death. And secondly, secondly, they were not Saul's to kill. Yet he has them killed in order to soothe his pride. And by killing the people of Nob, not only is Saul killing innocent people, but it is a direct attack upon who? Because that which is consecrated to God, what? Belongs, Belongs to God. Because those people were consecrated to God. They were set apart to God. They belonged specifically, not generally the way that everything belongs to God. They belonged to God in a very special way. They were consecrated to him, right? But man, we've seen this disrespect before, haven't we, in Saul? We've seen this disrespect before. He steps into the role of priest. He assumes to be a priest because he's in a hurry. <laughs> God rejects him. He refuses to do what God tells him to do. God rejects him. He refuses to face the giant Goliath. And then what happens when David steps in and David decides to be the champion of Israel? What does Saul do? He hates him because of it, right? Listen to this. Unless you get rid of your pride, God will not use you. If you want anything significant to write down in your notes this morning, write this down. Unless you get rid of your pride, God will not use you. Do you want to be rejected by God? Here's a quick way of doing it. Be prideful. 
in his book, Mere Christianity. Anybody ever read that? Mere Christianity? C.S. Lewis writes in that book that pride leads to every other vice. So pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. You believe that? Because what does pride say? Think about the things that pride says. Yeah. Pride says I, pride says me, pride says I want, pride says I think, why aren't you doing what I want you to do? That's what pride says. Pride is selfishness. Pride makes us hate everything that doesn't make us feel good about ourselves. That's pride. Pride turns into this whole list of other sins. So pride, is it a good thing? God's people, let me ask you this. Is pride a good thing? No. You ever known someone who was always critical? That's their pride. Someone who's always uh, let you know how you don't measure up? A lot of times that has nothing to do with you. What does that have to do with? Their pride. Have you ever had someone who just wouldn't give you a chance? You tried hard, they just wouldn't give you a chance. A lot of times that's their pride. And sometimes we dismiss that. We go, oh, that's just how they are. (laughs) You ever heard that? Well, how they are is going to get them rejected by God. Because God rejects the proud. As it says all throughout Scripture, look at all these places where it's mentioned in Scripture. This exact quote over and over and over and over again. You think it's important? (laughs) God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so in previous weeks, we even looked at Elab, who is David's older brother. We looked at Saul. We even looked at Goliath. All three of those people had pride as the root of their issue. It was pride that made Elab think that God's champion, David, he thought David was evil and conceited. Who was conceited? Elab was conceited, right? It was pride that made Goliath feel offended. Why was Goliath offended? Because I'm a mighty champion, and who do they send out to fight me? A runt, right? They send a runt out to fight me. What is that? And today what we're going to see is it's the pride of Saul, first of all, that makes him hate David, and it also makes him do some pretty horrible things, right? It makes him wipe out an innocent city. It's the pride of Saul that makes him hate the righteousness of King David. It's his pride that makes him hate the righteousness of King David. And speaking of the righteousness of David, here is where we read about um, David and we come across the thing that makes him weird, Here's another thing that makes him atypical, okay? It makes him not normal. David's on the run from Saul because Saul sees David as being his enemy, right? Saul knows that David's been doing good things for Israel, and when it's brought up, Saul concedes the fact, but then after time, his pride wells up again, and so he chases David. He tries to kill David. Listen listen to this. Answer this question. You meet your enemy in a dark alley. What do you do? You meet somebody who has declared war on you. And you have an opportunity to take them out. What do you do? (laughs) Think about all the different forms, right? This is going to take. But you have it. It's been handed to you. Right? You meet him in a dark alley, you got your pocket knife, what do you do? (laughs) And this is how David's atypical. In chapter 24, 1 Samuel 24, 
we read this account of Saul going into, the, into this cave and he goes into the cave to use the bathroom. Okay? He goes to relieve himself, it says. Um, he didn't know when he goes into this cave who's down deep in the back of the cave. Now, David and his army are, and that's how big this cave is, right? So David and his army are down hiding in this cave. They're deep inside of the cave. David's men say, hey, David, this is it, man, right? Here's the opportunity. God's handed him to you. You need to seize this opportunity. You need to go up there and you need to kill him. But instead of doing that, David goes up and he cuts a piece of Saul's robe off. And that piece is going to serve as proof. Okay, here in a minute. I want you to look at 1 Samuel 24, verses 9 and 10, because I think this explains the major difference between Saul and David. And I think it helps us understand the atypical behavior of David. As Saul goes to leave the cave, David makes himself known, and this is what he says. Why do you listen when men say, David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. What is David saying there? David is saying that even though Saul is out to do him harm, it isn't David's place to kill Saul. God is the one who chose Saul. God is the one who gave him the kingdom. Saul, though he is rejected by God as king, has still been consecrated to God. And that which is consecrated to God, what? Belongs to God. You see the contrast there? Just like those priests, even if they were deserving of death, it was God's place to kill them because they were consecrated to God. They belonged to God. And we see this even clearer in another section. In 1 Samuel 26, There's this other place where it's at night. David finds Saul's camp. He takes a couple of his soldiers with him. Saul's lying asleep in the middle of the camp. There's 3,000 troops around him. David and the other two are able to sneak into the camp. They make their way. Finally, they make their way to Saul without being detected. And Abishai, one of the men, this guy wants to use Saul's own spear, right? And just, boom, pin him to the ground. And here's what it says in chapter 26, verses 9 through 11. David said to Abishai, don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him. Or his time will come and he will die. Or he will go into battle and perish But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. See, David has an atypical. David has a different, a not normal perspective, right? Saul belongs to God. God had Saul anointed as king. If God wants Saul dead... Who's going to kill him? See? Now, if an enemy kills Saul in battle, then God's wrath can come upon that enemy. But David didn't see it as his place to kill someone who belongs to God. And that is a, that's a contrast that we see between Saul and David, right? It's a contrast of, of pride versus faith. Saul's pride led him to kill an innocent town that had been consecrated to God. Yet David's faith led him to show mercy to a man that was out to kill him because that man had been consecrated to God. And this gets right 
to the statement about David being a man after whose heart? A man after God's heart. How did David see the things that belong to God? What kind of respect did David have for the people and the things that God claim is his? And don't get me wrong, there are definitely times when David stands up and he defeats his enemies, right? I mean, David killed giants. The song says he killed thousands. Even we see one account where he goes out and he kills Philistines just to collect enough proof (laughs) to marry Saul's daughter. Yet when it comes to the things of God, David takes an entirely different course of action. Why? Because David loved God. And therefore, David loved the things of God. David respected that which has been consecrated to God. And even when Ahimelech gives David the consecrated bread, right? He gives him the consecrated bread from the tabernacle as provisions for his troops. We see the respect that David has for God and that he says, hey, I consecrate my troops every time we go to battle. These men are consecrated and set apart to God. Even when we go and do horrible things in battle, they are God's, they are God's army, right? So they can have then the consecrated bread because they are ceremonially clean. They are holy before God. So the question today for us is, all right, Saul or David, which one of those men do we most closely resemble? Is everything about you? (laughs) Or is your life driven by your faith? Are you willing to be atypical? Because most people in the world, what is it about? So when you decide not to be that way, when you decide to not live a prideful life like that, what are you going to be? You're going to be different. You're going to be atypical. You're going to stand out. You're not going to be normal. And so the question is, are you willing to stand out? Are you willing to make decisions based upon your desire to please your God? Do you have a heart? Are you a person after God's own heart? And let's face it, people like David, what are they? They are few and far between. So we gather here today and let's make a decision. Let's decide to be different from the world. Let's put away our pride and let's live lives of faith. Let's begin to love what God loves. Let's begin once again to honor and respect things that are consecrated to God. Today, we're going to offer an opportunity. Think about it this way. We're going to offer an opportunity for you to consecrate yourself to God. That's kind of what we do when we are baptized, right? I mean, there's a lot that's loaded in there. Forgiveness of sins, gift of the Holy Spirit, all those things, right? But what are you basically doing? You're saying, I'm belonging to him, right? I'm being set apart for him. I'm consecrating to him. You give yourself to Jesus. You let Jesus forgive you, let the Holy Spirit indwell you, and then you live your life with a heart for God. Today, you make that decision. Let's all stand up together. We're going to sing a song today. You make that decision for the Lord today.